Shouts fill the frigid Baltic air as people scramble over one another to try and reach the lifeboats. Explosions from within the ship erupt through the deck. The passengers of the Wilhelm Gustloff jump overboard into the icy water. The number of lives lost from the sinking of this German cruise liner will dwarf the losses of both the Titanic and the Lusitania combined. The worst part of it all, this was not a military vessel, and most of the lives lost were civilians. As Nazi defeat at the end of World War II became more and more inevitable, supporters of the party began to panic. The Soviet forces that were sweeping through the Eastern Front loomed in everyone's mind. Anyone who allied themselves with the Axis powers were at the mercy of the incoming Soviets. This was a frightening thought as propaganda spread by both sides painted the Soviets as vicious soldiers. Tales of them murdering Nazi supporters for revenge was the stuff of nightmares and oftentimes true. This led to anyone in the path of the Soviet forces to flee in fear. In order to reach safety, Germans and other Axis supporters needed to get back to the motherland. With land routes cut off by Allied forces, there was only one way to get back to Germany, and that was by boat. In the province of East Prussia, squeezed between the Soviet Union and Poland, Axis supporters flooded the docks to try and get onto any ship leaving for Germany before enemy forces arrived. The Wilhelm Gustloff was docked in the port city of Gotenhafen. Originally, the 25,000-ton luxury liner was used as part of the strength through joy movement of the Nazi party. It was constructed as a way to reward workers, soldiers, and officers by taking them on a relaxing cruise in the midst of World War II. As the situation became more dire for the Nazis, the ship was repurposed into a floating barracks and eventually became an evacuation vessel. It would carry people away from the incoming Soviet forces via the Baltic Sea. The mass evacuation of Axis supporters back to Germany was named Operation Hannibal. New arrivals from around the surrounding areas overwhelmed the city of Gotenhafen. Refugees flooded the docks and onto the Wilhelm Gustloff. At first, the crew tried to make maintain order and took only passengers with tickets. However, as the situation quickly got out of control, they stuck people in every available space on the ship. Everyone in Gotenhafen was cold, exhausted, and hungry. The Wilhelm Gustloff was crammed full of people and was well over its capacity. There was no way to keep a reliable passenger manifest, so the exact number of people on the ship when it launched is unknown, but it's estimated that around 10,000 passengers were on board when the ship set sail. The Gustloff was originally built for less than 2,000 passengers, so it was well over capacity. The ship left port on January 30, 1945, bound for Kiel, Germany. The senior officers of the ship had to make a difficult choice. The Allied forces had deployed mines in the shallower waters to stop military vessels from traveling along the coast. However, the Wilhelm Gustloff was not a military vessel and did not have any weapons on board. If the ship struck a mine, it would cause irreparable damage and everyone would have to abandon the ship. The chances of making it all the way along the coast from their current location to Germany was next to impossible. The other option for the Gustloff was to venture out into the open water waters of the Baltic Sea. If they were careful, they might be able to slip by the Soviet submarines that patrolled the deeper waters. The weather in January was not ideal for sailing because of constant snow and wind. It made navigation by sight extremely difficult, but it would also hide the ship from enemy periscopes. The officers decided their best course of action was to make a run for it in open water. Initially, the Gustloff had two torpedo boats that would accompany it for protection. Unfortunately, one broke down and the other left the cruise liner to take a different route, leaving the Gustloff to fend for itself with no guns and thousands of civilians on board. At this point in the war, almost all Nazi ships were being used to try and hold back Allied forces that were closing in on all fronts, so the officers of the Gustloff decided that they were on their own. They launched at night to try to keep the ship hidden. However, after traveling through rough weather, the navigation lights were turned on to increase visibility and make sure the Gustloff didn't strike anything that would damage the hull. Unfortunately, the lights didn't just increase the Gustloff's visibility, but also made it stand out on the surface of the black waters. The ship began to sail westward in a mad dash to make it to Germany before being spotted. As the Gustloff launched, Hitler delivered his final radio address before taking his own life. The Führer's voice echoed mechanically over the speakers on the Wilhelm Gustloff. He urged the nation to resist and to never surrender, even though he was planning to take the easy way out. Hitler knew if captured he would be tried for his heinous war crimes, so he committed suicide. As Hitler spewed his fascist doctrine across the airways, all the passengers aboard the Gustloff were thinking about was reaching safety. Unfortunately for almost everyone on board, they wouldn't make it back to the homeland. As the Wilhelm Gustloff sloshed through the choppy waters of the Baltic, a nearby Soviet submarine spotted the ship. The submarine was designated S-13 and was under the command of Alexander Marinesco. Marinesco did not have the most prestigious record and was known for not always following the chain of command. He was currently on a mission but had been delayed because he got drunk while docked. Marinesco was known to indulge in drinking a little too frequently and a little too much, and the night he spotted the Wilhelm Gustloff was no different. The lights the ship was using to navigate alerted Marinesco of the Gustloff's location. Since the Soviets were on a mission for a 
revenge, Marinesco thought he would be a hero for destroying a German ship. He had no idea that it was a cruise liner filled with civilians. At around 9 p.m., the Soviet submarine released three torpedoes. Each one had been inscribed with messages that embodied the Soviets' desire for revenge against the Nazis for what they did to their country and their people. All three torpedoes struck the Wilhelm Gustloff and exploded. One torpedo went off in the crew's living quarters, another in the swimming pool area, and the final exploded in the part of the ship where the women's naval auxiliary unit was located. Hundreds of people died on impact. Others were trapped under rubble and bulkheads. They would go down with the ship. Moments after the impact, it was clear what would happen. The passengers and the crew made a mad dash for the lifeboats. The ship itself barely had enough lifeboats to hold the normal number of people the ship was capable of carrying, and on this voyage, the maximum capacity was exceeded by around 8,000 people. There was no way that everyone would fit in the lifeboats. One survivor recounted seeing people trampled to death as everyone ran for their lives. Unfortunately, many of these victims were children who were caught under the feet of the mob as everyone fought for survival. As people pushed their way up the stairs to the lifeboats, other passengers were forced over the railing. Some people fell to the deck below while others descended into the depths of the frigid sea. The ship tilted hard to the port side. This meant that now only the lifeboats on the starboard side of the ship were accessible, cutting the amount of people that could be saved even further. Survivors of the sinking Gustloff remember in vivid detail the horrors that unfolded in the minutes that followed the attack. As full lifeboats dropped into the water, the passengers looked up at the stranded people on the deck of the ship. Realizing that all of the lifeboats had either been launched or destroyed, people started throwing themselves overboard into the icy water. Many died on impact. Those who survived would not last long in the nearly freezing water. Survivors of the plunge into the Baltic Sea would swim frantically, trying to reach the lifeboats that were moving away from the sinking ship. The lifeboats that were already at capacity needed to defend themselves from being tipped over. They could not fit any more people on board, so the passengers would shove those trying to climb into their boats away and back into the sea. In dire situations, the lifeboats would use their oars to hit people's hands and heads, trying to stop them from capsizing their lifeboat and killing all on board. The survivors in the lifeboats remember the gruesomeness of pushing people away to freeze in the Baltic waters, but it was life or death circumstances. Either they defended themselves from being tipped over, or they would have been lost as well. The survivors of the Wilhelm Gustloff would be haunted by that night for the rest of their lives. For the passengers who remained on the ship, it soon became clear that death was imminent. The freezing water would be a slow, cold way to go, so some passengers decided on a quicker way out of the situation. One survivor remembers seeing a Nazi soldier with his family hanging on for dear life as the Gustloff began to list and descend into the depth of the sea. The soldier pulled out his pistol and shot his wife and children to save them from dying in a slow, painful way. Unfortunately for the soldier, he had used all the bullets by the time he turned the gun on himself. The man closed his eyes and let go of the railing he was holding onto. The survivor said he remembers seeing the man slide down the icy deck after the bodies of his family, and then he disappeared into darkness. Eventually, German rescue boats came to the aid of the survivors of the Wilhelm Gustloff. The ship scooped up the lifeboats containing passengers that were nearly frozen from the frigid environment of the Baltic Sea in January. The rescuers did not only have the survivors on their mind, but the submarine that had sunk the Wilhelm Gustloff as well. The ships had to make constant evasive maneuvers to ensure they didn't meet the same fate as the Wilhelm Gustloff. In order to keep from being in one spot for too long, the rescue ships oftentimes had to pass by lifeboats that did not show immediate signs of survivors. When their boats were filled to capacity, the rescue ships turned around and returned to Germany. Many lifeboats and survivors of the initial wreck were left behind to die with the rest of the victims of the Gustloff. It was just an hour after the S-13's torpedoes struck the Gustloff that the ship sank to the bottom of the sea. The following morning, the surrounding area was filled with floating, frozen bodies. The rescue ships recorded that many of the bodies belonged to children whose life jackets had rolled them face down in the water and caused them to drown. The morning after the attack, only one survivor was found. The survivor was a baby swaddled in blankets aboard a lifeboat surrounded by the bodies of frozen passengers. One of the officers of the rescue ship that found the infant adopted him and raised him as his own. Of the 10,000 souls on the Wilhelm Gustloff, only around 1,000 survived. It was due to the countless tragedies and the war finally coming to an end that the tragedy of the Wilhelm Gustloff did not get much attention. It was the largest loss of life on any ocean liner in history. Also, neither the Germans nor the Soviets wanted to broadcast that so many civilian lives had been senselessly lost in such a brutal way. Weeks after the disaster, the news finally started to reach people around Europe and the United States. The sinking of the Wilhelm Gustloff was the worst maritime tragedy in history. The lives lost not only included German civilians, but Prussians, Lithuanians, Poles, Estonians, and Croatians as well. The death toll was likely close to 9,000 people. In war, people die, but the sheer number of civilian lives lost during the attack is unforgivable. Regardless of which side of the war the passengers were on, they did not deserve to freeze to death in the icy waters of the Baltic Sea. Now watch why did nine ships disappear in perfect weather, or check out why this sinking was worse than the Titanic.